This is the Rabbit Tower one. CES is a huge deal every year. It's the time in January when massive companies and startups alike get together and try to sell journalists and people on what the future of consumer electronics is. There's some software, there's some hardware, there's a little bit in between, and AI has been huge at CES this year. That is to say we've seen good ideas that use AI and bad ideas that use AI, but one of the most thought-provoking that has been all over the internet is the Rabbit R1. So basically this device is like if you cloned the device from her but made it look like a Tomagotchi, made it bright orange, and then gave it access to an inference API, and then made sure that left-handed people couldn't use it. But it's really cool looking, it's kinda new, and we can hope that it's better than the humane AI pin. Make me sound more excited. Since I think that's a form factor we've all decided doesn't really work for AI, even if it has a really cool laser projector. So, is this device actually groundbreaking? What kind of AI does it use? What makes it tick? And do I actually think it's the next iPhone? Uh, the answer might be a little bit more complex than meets the eye. So, welcome to AI Flux, let's get into it. So, there's a lot to take in with this new device. It's hard to look at the Humane AI pin and look at this and see a lot that's different. The main difference is the camera can swivel, there is a scroll wheel, and again, you can only seemingly use this if you're right-handed with one hand. But I think it's kind of cool. They got the pricing right. It's only $200 and there's no subscription. You can use this with voice. In theory, you can have action-based multimodal interactions with the world around you. And the general idea is making AI easier to use than just having it on your phone. Of course, there are a lot of people that are saying, why do I need something more than my phone? And I think the point is that phones are still really expensive, they're heavy, and you have to charge them all the time. So the idea is, why can't I just have something that's easier to interact with strapped to my human that isn't a phone? So I have my own opinions. I'm going to talk about the device first, though, because I think we need to give them credit for what they've developed in an incredibly short period of time. Now, there's actually a plot twist here, because if you watch the entire 30-minute long keynote, they actually claim that they built the entire action-based LLM and OS before they built the device. Large action models concept and test results are so powerful that we decided to make a one-of-a-kind mobile device. And they claim that their LLM was so good that they had to build a device, which is something that I'm not sure I completely believe, but... Their software does seem pretty good. I've worked on hardware stuff before, and this is not easy. So even having a prototype for CES is a huge deal. And the initial response has been good. They've actually completely sold out of their initial run. At least initial reviewers like MKBHD probably want one of these. So the design comes first, and it's striking. And the funny thing was when I first saw this, it reminded me of the weird mini ITX computer case that Teenage Engineering made. And little did I know, they actually hired Teenage Engineering, the geniuses behind all kinds of wild uh, synth tools. It has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. It has a camera that can rotate 360 degrees called the Rabbit Eye. There's a push to talk button, an analog scroll wheel, also a touchscreen, and it has microphones and speakers. What's also cool is it runs on a custom OS. Fortunately, not Windows XP, but it uses a custom OS that they called LAM, or a large action model that they claim understands and executes human intentions on computers and should help you get things done. Now the question is, what can you actually get done with this device? The demo largely was kind of open-ended and they gave some pretty interesting examples, which I'll get into later. But the core focus here is this is all built around an LLM and the negatives start here. Uh, so basically this actually doesn't have any onboard compute, which is the biggest difference between this device and an iPhone, even an iPhone 12 from almost you know, three to four years ago, which as we know, you can actually run a clipped down version of Mistral 7B on. Now, I think it's important to actually define this device as Rabbit defines it. So they say the R1 is a standalone device driven by natural language. It's simple to use. You can ask Rabbit anything, just like using ChatGPT. Rabbit answers within 500 milliseconds. Uh, this is something that I've talked about quite a bit. Um, the response time is massive when it comes to user experience and these standalone devices are all about user experience. So let's enter what they call the rabbit hole. Uh, the R1 can interact with all kinds of applications by logging into services on the web portal. So again, just like Humane, this is all based in their own kind of web gated garden, which I think is kind of weird, but okay. And the camera can analyze your surroundings and take actions in real time. Now we don't actually know what model they're using to do all of this inference. It's probably something that's cheap enough for them to run, or at least that a VC has given them boatloads of money just to run and say that it's free for now. But the insights I want to cover first aren't coming from me. They're actually coming from one of the founders of Perplexity AI, 
which in my opinion is, is one of the most advanced tools for coding and like actionable use of LLMs. Basically with even these devices come out, it seems like we always see people who are massively uh, on the camp of this is the coolest thing ever, like this is gonna revolutionize everything. And then there's the people that are really cynical and quite frankly, I feel like I'm kind of right in between just like Aravind uh, Srivandas. This guy is the CEO of, of Perplexity, so he pretty much knows what he's talking about when it comes to LLMs. He says, seeing a lot of criticism for Rabbit, Humane, and similar devices, both publicly on Twitter and privately. The bull case for AI native agent IC devices is that it depreciates app-based user interaction. So basically it's, it's easier to use LLMs this way, or these companies think it should be. He says he differs from this other entrepreneur, in that the bottleneck is the hardware or fabrication facilities alone. So basically how many of these you can make to then uh, give access to your model. When in reality, if you can just have an API, you know, millions of people can use your model as opposed to thousands or just how many devices you can make. We actually do not have good action models yet. Well-grounded in natural language. It is quite likely that GPT 4.5 or 5 can likely get to the sort of sweet spot. There is GPT 3.5 got to. Basically in terms of being fa fast enough and responsive enough to kind of interact with in a way and then they mention chat and text, so this makes sense. However, when that happens, the bottleneck won't be the hardware because these models can never run on device. For the foreseeable future, the next two to three years, at least. More algorithmic progress on how to get such capabilities in models that can run on device is still an open question. And the question here is, what is this device actually for then? I mean, obviously they weren't developing this with some wild GPU or neural compute engine like Apple's been working on. So, it's basically just another wrapper around a remote AI. It's just the wrapper is a physical piece of hardware. And I think it's important to note here that the most capable models for now, assuming open source doesn't continue to get better and better, will just require you know, an, an over-the-air API that does inference off-site. However, the question is, in the long run, if they're not using uh, a common LLM, what is the trade-off for being limited by how much hardware you can build? And I would say that you probably are able to capture better, a better snapshot of how people want to use these and you're capturing data. And the big key is you're the only one getting it. So keynotes are always interesting, but they're especially interesting when the first product demo is the CEO of the company, Rick, rolling himself in real time. Oh, funny seeing you here, Rick. Let me take a look. We're gonna give you up. What? Am I getting Rick Rogan my own keynote? And they both answered small questions like ordering pizzas or ordering an Uber. Get me a ride from my office to home now. Of course, I will book an Uber ride for you from your office to your home. Please confirm the ride. I have six people with three luggages. Get me a 12 inch pizza from Pizza Hut delivered to here. The most ordered option on the app is fine. Ordering a 12 inch pizza from Pizza Hut. Since you mentioned that the most ordered option is fine, I will select that for you. I just created an order for a 12-inch pizza. It's going to be hand-tossed with a classic marinara sauce and topped with regular cheese. Please confirm your order. That sounds really good. I just confirmed an order here. And they also show that the Rabbit R1 can answer the big questions like, what the purpose of the universe is. What's the nature of the reality? The nature of reality is a topic that has captivated the minds of philosophers and thinkers throughout history. However, the Rabbit R1 is still quite capable in other more common tasks, like things you'd put into Google. So for instance, the current stock price of Coke or what actors were in a movie. Uh, both of these things I don't think would take very long using apps, but it's kind of cool, I guess. What's the stock price of Coca-Cola? Searching for the stock price of Coca-Cola. The stock price of Coca-Cola, KO, is $59.76. Who played the role Oppenheimer in Christopher Nolan's latest movies? In Christopher Nolan's most recent film, Oppenheimer, the role of J. Robert Oppenheimer is played by Killian Murphy. Play Kraftwerk's Pocket Calculator. Playing Pocket Calculator by Kraftwerk for you. So, yes, these devices can be dumb, you can say they're goofy, Honestly, I think this one is kind of goofy, but yeah, that's kind of my take here. I'm right in the middle. Would I buy one of these even for $200? Probably not. Um, the price point makes way more sense than the Humane AI pin, where like if this thing falls off your shirt, you're out, you know, six to $800, which is kind of insane. I also would argue that in time, uh, I would vastly prefer this just on an Apple Watch, and there are a lot of people on Twitter who've actually brought this up. 
like we already know that there's a lot of shared compute between the Apple Watch and your iPhone. And quite frankly, if none of the compute is happening on device anyway, I would much rather pay $200 for an Apple Watch app that has the equivalent uh, compute. And just like when Siri was really new, I mean, there are very few people actually using cameras to infer a lot on a lot of the stuff. And I, right now I would just use my phone. So maybe I'm kind of a boomer when it comes to this and I'm just not a huge fan, but I really wanted to give this a shot and Teenage Engineering is a company that I love. So yeah, I'm gonna leave it there. Now, uh, it wouldn't be a full video um, now that we've gone over kind of the quick demo that they went through if we didn't go over some of the negatives. You know, the thing is, is th this demo and their presentation was very desperate. Uh, the, present the presenter is basically LARPing as Steve Jobs. They're claiming this is going to be the next massive thing. And as opposed to being, you know, a next step function in how we interact with computers and AI, it feels like kind of a Tamagotchi type thing. You know, it's $200. It's not, uh, it doesn't do everything. It doesn't replace everything my phone does really. And, you know, there, there's still some questions. So really it's that people really have to still speak to this device to like convince you that it's great to use. Uh, many people, again, might not want to carry their phone and the Rabbit R1 in their pocket. In the keynote, they also didn't really show the screen doing complex tasks, uh, like booking a trip or a hotel or a car. Uh, some of these things you just like to have a browser to do. And a big reason these apps kind of work is uh, at least on these AI devices, is that you're not having to do that because it makes it easier. Um, some things are also not really addressed uh, that we have no clue how they work. So for instance, uh, which LLM they're actually using, they're doing hardware and that's hard enough. So to think that they've created their own completely bespoke LLM is just not realistic. Maybe in the future, you know, another benefit of this is that in theory, they can just switch to whatever the best one is. Um, we also don't really know what the capabilities are outside of the limited demo that they showed us in about 30 minutes. And if you want to see uh, kind of a cut down version of that, we've also uploaded that if you want to check that out as well. And the other thing is, is there only one voice? Like the, the TTS was pretty limited and it seemed kind of cool. Um, they were also pretty spotty on what actually was going on internally. So like, does this have GPS? Does it take video? Does it have a camera app? Uh, and I think some of these things were deliberately omitted just to make it clear that this is an AI first product and that's kind of what it's for. And they didn't really want to show us uh, too much outside of that, which to their credit kind of makes sense. Now the picture actually continues to get worse. The issue here is that if companies like Apple continue to properly integrate AI into their devices and Apple generally does this slow and steady, just getting win after win and hitting home runs once they actually commit. It might be able to perform everything shown in their keynote showing the Rabbit R1. And they already have a huge user base along with a massive developer base. So it's really risky to get into hardware and hardware on its own is risky enough as is even when you're not adding on the AI kind of component here. And frankly, I don't see Apple having any reason to acquire um, Rabbit. I mean, maybe to turn it into an iOS app that then is put on your uh, Apple Watch. But that's kind of my take here. Um, after all, it's just a demo. This is CES. A lot of products at CES aren't entirely real or reasonable because they're so forward facing. And we're not sure, but you know, will it work as well in reality? We don't really know. Will it understand people's accents? There are a lot of challenges that Rabbit hasn't addressed yet, even though they've already gotten over the first hurdle of actually just making the hardware. I actually really like the keynote and I see a market for it. I'm not sure they're really gonna cover their bases, even just for development with a $200 device. Um, maybe they're going for a volume play. Just by looking at some of the responses yesterday uh, on Twitter and from some of my other friends who are uh, AI developers, there are users wanting a single purpose device with less distractions. And a device for their kids or uh, kind of a collector's item like a Tomagotchi is kind of an interesting angle we haven't seen yet. I'm excited to see my friend get his. I'm probably gonna try it out um, if and when they ship this. And uh, again, like the biggest parallel I see with this device uh, in comparison to the Humane AI pin is that this device seems wildly similar to the device from her. And I still think that's kind of cool because I've really enjoyed that movie. Um, I'm still like a sucker for the soundtrack anyway. So I'm probably not gonna buy one of these. Uh, I think this device is maybe a bit of a stretch, but again, I love teenage engineering and it's always cool to see new AI angles um, for how we interact with them and thinking past a phone or past just like a gradio window for how we use these services. So what do you guys think? Are you gonna buy one? Do you think it's kind of a gimmick? 
Uh, do you think everything at CES is a gimmick? Please let me know in the comments. If you learned something in this video or you liked it, um, please like and subscribe. It helps us out immensely. And we'll see you in the next video.